Good day, and welcome to our second video in a series of presentations on particular cases of patients who underwent MCG testing and the effects that accurate early detection had upon their lives. The purpose of this video is the same as previous. First, onboarding and training physicians to better understand how best to use MCG in acute chest pain slash unstable angina settings, and learn from real-world examples of how to use MCG to detect and measure moderate to severe ischemia initially, then monitor the patient's moderate improvements after being given acute bedside treatment when conventional tools fail. Secondly, again, to demonstrate how to visualize the way that MCG works behind the computer screen to deliver measurable mathematic expressions that are clinically relevant to better understand the cardiovascular system and its many complex functions. In this case, we want to demonstrate how MCG was helpful to the decision-making process for physicians at the bedside of a patient by detecting both their initial high ischemic burden and a sudden reduction of said ischemia quantitatively, along with being able to decide whether patients should be admitted to hospitals for more extensive workups and treatment without putting them at risk. As before, we will be brushing over some of the details of the purposes of the mathematical functions used by our diagnosis engine, but this information can be found in our primer, which should be reviewed first before watching this video. The following is from a physician's report, a typical case of new onset acute angina in an office setting dated at 6-10-2020. Patient is a 72-year-old white male, presenting to my outpatient office for subacute chest pain that began approximately 12 hours before coming in. Patient describes the pain as heaviness in his chest on the left side, feeling like a pressure in his chest lasting for over 30 minutes at a time. He rated the pain as a 6 out of 10 at this time. States that the pain came on and off throughout the evening, but he was able to sleep for a couple of hours. Patient denies any nausea or vomiting, but the heaviness is persisting. He is also complaining of newly onset fatigue. He did state that his blood pressure that night was in the 170 systolic range, so he took an aspirin last night. This was the first episode of any type of chest pain that the patient had had in the past. In the office, his blood pressure was 130 over 70. Pulse was 101, weight 223 pounds, BMI of 30.2. EKG obtained in the office was normal sinus rhythm with questionable ST segment depression changes on the inferior leads. At that point, nitroglycerin was given to the patient and an MCG was performed. Patient was noted to be on medications including 20 milligrams a day of enalapril, 10 milligrams a day of atorvastatin, 0.4 milligrams QHS of Flomax, and 50,000 units of vitamin D weekly. Immediately after receiving sublingual nitroglycerin, his first MCG test session was performed and was noted that his first test showed a value of 6, with moderately severe myocardial ischemia, and subsequent testing reduced down to 4 with his chest pain resolved, after about 5 to 10 minutes. This patient was diagnosed with unstable angina, and a consultant cardiologist admitted him for diagnostic angiogram due to his high risk of being positive for critical stenosis. At that point, the patient had no further chest pain throughout the hospital stay for the next 23 hours. The patient had negative cardiac enzymes, troponin less than 0.2, and his cholesterol was at goal of 115 with an LDL of 34. EKG was again repeated and found to be negative. Cardiac catheterization was done and was shown to be completely normal. Intravascular ultrasound was not done during this procedure, however. The patient continued to have a persistent elevated blood pressure measured at 149.76 on discharge with instructions that we were to increase his medications if his blood pressure persisted in being elevated. The patient returned for a follow-up a few days after discharge. His blood pressure was still elevated, so we added 5 mg of daily amlodipine. He still complains of problems with fatigue and shortness of breath on minimal exertion, but no further chest pains. In the meantime, a CT of his chest was performed to rule out PE and D-dimer, which both turned out to be negative, but the CT was questionable with possible artifacts in the pulmonary artery. A repeat CT was done the next day, which produced the same results. For now, the cause of the chest pain was still a mystery to his physicians. As presented on this slide, he was tested in two back-to-back -back MCG test sessions with a total of six 82-second recorded resting EKG test segments. The first MCG test session showed that he scored 6.0, 6.0, 4.0 within the first five minutes, and the subsequent three tests reported scores of 5.0, 3.0, and a final 4.0. His first three tests immediately following the administration of the sublingual nitroglycerin were rated an 
E in the eight categories rating for myocardial dysfunction, i.e. high myocardial dysfunction with a greatly increased propensity to worsen to a potential acute heart failure or a major adverse cardiac event known as MACE. However, the second session of testing showed incrementally decreased scoring from two 6.0s down to 5.0, 3.0, and a final 4.0 between a 5 to 10 minute time interval following the sublingual nitroglycerin. His second MCG test session was rated a category D, an incremental and temporary improvement. Additionally, the readings on his ischemia skewed towards alternating between local, global, and local for each test, indicating a typical functional ischemia pattern. Meanwhile, although the functional expressions of the acute pulmonary heart ventricular hypertrophy and increased myocardial compliance resolved over time, the right-sided global asynchrony persisted with added local asynchrony, which may be associated with his complaints of shortness of breath. What's significant is the persistent atrial fibrillation, ventricular arrhythmia, incipient arrhythmia, and myocarditis, reproducibly pointing to an acute status transitioning to a more chronic status. These are graphical representations of the auto power spectra measurements from both of the patient sessions. As stated in the previous video, MCG understands the unique expressions of cardiovascular systems by breaking down electrical signals of the heart into frequency bands that can be viewed and measured as such by the analysis engine. From here, the engine measures the peaks, troughs, interpeak intervals, and overall power output. These slides demonstrate a resolution of the higher frequency peaks as part of the functional change to the heart following sublingual nitroglycerin treatments. Moving along to his phase angle shift visualization, the expressions shown are both quite abnormal. His post-treatment analysis shows worsened expressions from only global asynchrony to global plus local asynchrony, and also shows that his mainly functional ischemia-induced myocardial abnormalities still remain with some only minor and subtle changes. We believe that atrial fibrillation and other cardiac arrhythmias can be caused more often by functional ischemia and acute or chronic myocarditis. This information was, until now, not available, but with MCG we now have a tool that can perform early detection of these dysfunctions to enable physicians and patients alike to make better informed decisions on the courses of actions that they need to take. This function, impulse response, is useful for looking at the response of the system to an internal or external stimulus. It can be used to measure the myocardial compliance. When it is increased, this may indicate acute myocardial damage or myocarditis to ischemia. When decreased, it may indicate myocardial hypertrophy or increased stiffness of the myocardium due to hypertensive heart disease as one such example. Using this function, we can evaluate various arrhythmias and discover that certain mathematical elements are vital to the quantitative assessment of the patient's overall functional status, which we call disease severity scoring. Meanwhile, cross-correlation provides many very useful measurements, focusing visually on the results generated and shown in the graph, where the first session showed a triangular wall of peaks. The treatment results can be seen visually with a return to a more normal pattern that is much more clearly defined and easier to understand. These expressions may be attributed to the sublingual nitroglycerin that dilated the coronary arteries, especially the right coronary artery, to improve the supply to meet the increased demand. The initial supply and demand imbalance was probably the cause of his chest pain and many other complaints. These expressions may be temporary in nature, and generally we recommend more monitoring using MCG technology to see if long-acting nitroglycerin may be helpful to the patient's long-term health. The transfer function can serve as the bridge to move from one functional environment to another. The differences between the pre- and post-treatment measurements are, again, shown here as well. These colored heat maps represent the matrix outputs of the multiple functions we have discussed previously, and are not only useful to visualize the mathematic output of the analysis, but allows us to improve our machine learning algorithms in terms of pattern recognition for certain types of diseases, as well as perform critical disease severity calculations, both to understand a patient's immediate needs, as well as provide early detection and warning for sudden cardiac death. This objective means of understanding the intricacies of the human heart has given us the power we need to save patients the world over. And finally, these mathematical structural element matrices collect the results of the functions described previously to create these patterns in a transparent and reproducible manner. All these measurements and computations are automated and handled completely by the computer system, without the need for laborious and time-consuming and, frankly, boring human involvement in this work. In conclusion, this patient suffered an acute chest pain or unstable angina due to an episode of myocardial supply and demand imbalance, caused by decreased coronary compliance and a lack of dilation during the time of increased demand. This was temporarily resolved via a short-acting nitroglycerin treatment. 
However, the other dysfunctions such as atrial fibrillation and beyond persistent or even slightly worsened, pointing to early onset of heart failure. For this patient's case in particular, there are a few points to take away. 1. The session patterns presented in the two consecutive sessions led to a diagnosis of functional ischemia due to non-obstructive CAD, later proven accurate via angiography, probably caused by elevated blood pressure and coronary vasospasm. These are impossible to detect using the conventional ECG and imaging tests. MCG, in direct contrast, can shine here. These measurements not only assist the physician to determine the cause of the symptoms, but also quantify the physiological impact on the reduction of the supply-demand imbalance using sublingual nitroglycerin at bedside. Two. Acute chest pain may be simply attributed to an episode of supply and demand imbalance from decreased coronary supply at times of increased myocardial demand due to peripheral resistance due to elevated blood pressure, caused by atherosclerotic changes involving the wall of the coronary arteries without any angiographically visible luminal encroachments. The vasodilation immediately following sublingual nitroglycerin temporarily led to coronary dilation and increased perfusion temporarily resolving the coronary supply and myocardial demand imbalance. If MCG was used as the primary tool for patient evaluation and long-term decision-making, he could have avoided hospital admission, invasive coronary angiography with its requisite risks of injury and death, two CT scans with radiation exposure, along with the high costs ranging in the tens of thousands of dollars in medical bills and the personal and professional time spent. And finally, three. The associated persistent functional and structural abnormalities point to persistent right-sided myocardial dysfunctions, which could explain his persistent shortness of breath, and if untreated, could lead to the onset of heart failure. Further monitoring of this patient's functional progression is completely justified. Millions of people face dilemmas like these on a daily basis, and we believe that MCG fulfills that urgent need for better physiological measurement tools. I hope this presentation has proved useful in better understanding some of how our system performs its diagnosis to save lives and cut costs for patients and doctors alike. If you have any questions, feel free to visit our website or send an email to info at premierheart.com and have a wonderful day. Thank you for your time.